Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. I've always been close to my little brother. Ever since he was born, I felt this need to protect him. You see, he's autistic, and sometimes people don't understand. Our parents work a lot, so I often take care of him. It's not easy, but I wouldn't have it any other way. That day started like any other. I decided to take my brother out for some fun. We went to the park, played his favorite games, and then I thought, hey, why not treat him to some boba? He loves the chewy tapioca pearls, and it always puts a smile on his face. So there we were, standing in line at the boba shop. Everything was going fine until my brother let out one of his sudden screams. I'm used to it, but I know it can startle people who don't know him. I tried to calm my brother down, telling him it was okay and that he was alright. But the damage was done. The teenager in front of us had jumped, spilling his boba all over the floor. I felt terrible. I apologized to the teenager, explaining about my brother's autism and how he sometimes gets overwhelmed. I offered to buy him a new boba. I reached for my wallet, but before I could, this woman, I assume she was the teen's mom, started going off on us. The woman rudely told me to keep my money and use it for my brother's therapy instead. I tried to explain that I understood she was upset, but there was no need for such comments. However, she cut me off, saying my brother should be in a mental hospital and not out scaring normal people. I was shocked. Who says that kind of thing about a child? I grabbed my brother's hand, ready to leave, when suddenly this guy, I guess the teen's dad, came out of nowhere and punched my brother in the chest. My brother started wailing, tears streaming down his face. I saw the man raising his fist again, and something in me snapped. Before I knew it, I had grabbed him and slammed him onto one of the tables. The woman started screaming for help, claiming I was assaulting her son, who apparently had anger issues. Her husband had just hit a child, and she was trying to paint him as the victim. I noticed her dialing on her phone, probably calling the cops. I told her to go ahead and call them pointing out that there were cameras and witnesses who would see exactly what happened. I turned my attention to my brother, who was still crying and holding his chest. I'd never seen anyone hurt him like that before, and it broke my heart. I comforted him, assuring him that I was there and that no one would hurt him again. As we waited for the police to arrive, I could hear the woman still ranting and raving. She was calling my brother a menace and falsely claiming he had attacked her son for no reason. Thankfully. Some of the other customers spoke up. One customer pointed out that it wasn't true and that the woman's husband had hit my brother first. Another customer agreed, saying they saw the whole thing and that my autistic brother hadn't done anything wrong. When the police arrived, they reviewed the security footage and took statements from witnesses. It was clear who the real aggressors were. A month later, I found out that the woman had been fined $2,000 for filing a false police report and causing a public disturbance. Her son, or I should say, her husband, was put back on probation. Turns out this wasn't his first time getting violent. But the best part? The boba shop owner heard about what happened and now gives my brother and me free boba whenever we visit. He told us he wanted to make sure we knew not everyone was like that awful family. My brother is doing better now. We've been working on some coping techniques for when he feels overwhelmed in public. And me? Well, I learned that sometimes you have to stand up to bullies even when they're adults. I just hope I never see that family again. But if I do, at least I know my brother and I can handle whatever they throw at us. I never thought working at a national rental car chain would be so eventful. Fresh out of college with a business degree, I figured it'd be all suits and vacationers. Our branch had its ups and downs. Some days were chaos. Others so slow we'd take cars for oil changes just to kill time. One particularly quiet afternoon, both my managers asked if I could hold down the fort while they grabbed lunch. No problem, I thought. I was chilling at the desk, scrolling through my phone, when the office line rang. Some older guy asked for me by name. I answered, introducing myself and asking how I could help. The man immediately launched into a complaint about a $25 fuel charge on his daughter's rental, demanding a refund and threatening to call corporate. I calmly offered to check his file and asked to put him on hold. He angrily refused, but I did it anyway. 
Checking the file, I saw notes clearly stating fuel was declined, and the customer agreed to a $25 fee if the car wasn't returned with the same fuel level. When I got back on the line, I explained that I couldn't issue a refund because his daughter had agreed to the fuel charge. The man exploded, accusing us of scamming his daughter and suggesting I had pocketed the money myself. I tried to explain our policy, emphasizing that we don't scam customers and clearly indicate all charges beforehand. The man wasn't having it and demanded to speak to a manager. When I told him they weren't available for another 20-30 minutes, he got even angrier. He started ranting about not wanting to waste his day at a rental car place and called us scumbags. Then he threatened to come down and have a little talk with me face to face. I couldn't help but laugh, which only infuriated him more. The man continued to bluster, bragging about his connections in the state and warning me that he knew my name. I calmly invited him to come resolve the issue in person, telling him I'd be there until 6. He insisted he was on his way, and I ended the call. When my managers returned, I filled them in. We all had a good laugh listening to the recording, joking about being threatened over $25. We forgot about it until later that afternoon when I saw a familiar girl get out of a car with her mom. The entitled dad was pouting in the passenger seat, like a child told no for the first time. The mom stormed in, screaming at my assistant manager. She demanded I be fired, accusing me of scamming her daughter. My assistant manager calmly explained that I had already addressed the issue and gave her two choices, leave voluntarily or be removed by the police. The woman angrily declared they'd never use our service again and threatened to complain to corporate. As she furiously backed out, she slammed into my assistant manager's car. We ran out to check the damage, only to find nothing on his car, not even a scratch. Meanwhile, their car needed a tow truck. The best part? Two weeks later, the entitled dad called asking if we had any cars available. He acted like nothing happened and rented regularly after that. He was even pleasant sometimes. Guess the experience humbled him a bit. Working at that rental place taught me more about people than any business class ever could. And hey, at least it made for some good stories. For eight long years, I worked at a company that slowly drained my soul. The workload was insane and the stress was eating me alive. With the cherry on top of this misery Sunday, a guy on my team who made it his personal mission to make my life hell. This dude was a year younger than me but acted like he was stuck in high school. You know the type, the jock who never grew up, still thinking he's hot stuff at 30. Let's call him jerk face because that's exactly what he was. Jerkface had this annoying habit of being nice when we were alone, but as soon as there was an audience, he'd turn into a grade-A bully. He'd pick a victim for the day and relentlessly tease them under the guise of workplace banter. If you ever got annoyed and stood up for yourself, he'd pull the I'm just messing around card and act like you were the problem. The last straw came when an ex-employee wrote a scathing review of our company on a job site. Just because they used a phrase I sometimes say, Jerk face decided I must have written it. He went on a crusade telling everyone in the office it was me, even though I proved I didn't even have an account on that site. I'm pretty sure he even told our boss after I left, which is why I never got any freelance work from them again. Finally, I'd had enough. I quit that toxic hellhole, but for some reason our team's group chat on WhatsApp kept going. I unfollowed jerk face on social media because honestly, I wanted nothing to do with him anymore. One morning, I woke up to find a message from Jerkface in our group chat. He was asking why I had unfollowed and unfriended him on Facebook. Can you believe this guy? Sending that message at 6.30 in the morning like a desperate ex. I was so done with his childish behavior, so I decided to be honest. I told him he was a bully and that I'd rather remove him from my life than make a big deal out of it. I also pointed out how immature it was to bring this up in the group chat instead of messaging me privately. You know what he did? He left the group chat and blocked me on everything. Real mature, right? I thought that was the end of it, and honestly, I was relieved. Three months later, I'm out with my husband, grabbing some food at a local pub. And who do I see? Jerk face, sitting with a girl I'd never seen before. Maybe it was the good food or the couple of drinks I'd had, but I was feeling extra confident that day. So I decided to say hello. I approached Jerkface with a big smile, greeting him and commenting on how long it had been since we'd seen each other. You should have seen his face. 
He looked like he'd seen a ghost, all wide-eyed and red-cheeked. I kept my smile plastered on as I asked how he was doing and if things were going well. Jerkface responded uncomfortably, clearly wanting the conversation to end. His new girl looked confused, so she asked how we knew each other. Jerkface mumbled something about us being former co-workers, so I decided to fill in the blanks. I explained to the girl that Jerkface used to be my workplace bully. I told her how he was actually the reason I struggled financially after leaving my old job, accusing me of writing a hostile review about the company, which I proved I didn't do, but it cost me a lot of freelance work. Jerkface's face went from red to purple. His date looked shocked and uncomfortable, but I wasn't done yet. I asked if this was his new girlfriend, Catherine, or if it was Georgia. I mentioned hearing that he was still with Sarah just last week. The girl's expression changed from confusion to anger in a split second. She glared at Jerkface, who looked like he wanted the ground to swallow him whole. I pretended to realize I'd put my foot in my mouth and said I should probably go. I said it was nice seeing Jerkface again and left. As I walked away, I could feel the tension radiating from their table. My husband, bless him, said he felt bad for the girl. And honestly, so did I. But part of me thinks I might have saved her from inevitably being dumped a few weeks later when Jerk Face got bored. After years of dealing with his bullying and the damage he'd done to my career, it felt amazing to finally see him face some consequences for being such a jerk. Sometimes karma needs a little push, and I was more than happy to give it one. My fiancé and I had been planning our backyard wedding for months. We're both pretty laid-back people, and we wanted something simple, intimate, and meaningful. Plus, it was a great way to save money while still having a beautiful celebration. We'd moved into our house about a year ago, and for the most part, our neighbors were great. Except for the woman next door. Let's just call her Karen. From day one, she acted like she owned the whole street, always complaining about something, always trying to control everyone else's business. But we tried to keep things civil, you know? Anyway, about two weeks before the wedding, I was out in the yard, measuring things for the setup, when Karen came stomping over. She called out to me, saying she needed to talk about something important. I hesitantly agreed, asking what was up. Karen then proceeded to tell me about her plans for a neighborhood barbecue and how she wanted to use our backyard for it. I politely explained that we were actually having our wedding in that very spot in two weeks on Saturday the 15th. Karen insisted that her barbecue was scheduled for the same day and demanding that we move our wedding. I tried to explain that we'd been planning this for months, that invitations had already gone out, that everything was set, but Karen wasn't having it. She claimed to be the head of the neighborhood association and argued that her barbecue was crucial for community bonding, dismissing our wedding as something that could wait. I stood my ground, refusing to change our wedding date and suggesting she could perhaps hold her barbecue on Sunday instead. Karen angrily rejected this idea, claiming the 15th had perfect barbecue weather and accusing me of being selfish. She then stormed off and I figured that was the end of it. The day of the wedding arrived. My fiancé and I were out early, setting everything up, chairs and arch, flowers, the whole deal. We'd just finished placing the cake on a table when we heard a commotion. There was Karen leading a group of people into our yard. They were carrying tables, coolers, and grills. Before we could even react, they started setting up right in the middle of our wedding space. I confronted Karen, demanding to know what she thought she was doing. She casually replied that they were setting up for the barbecue, claiming it was much better than what we had planned. My fiancé intervened, telling Karen and her group to leave immediately, emphasizing that this was our property and we were having our wedding here today. Karen dismissed our concerns, insisting that the yard was practically community property and that she had already invited everyone. She even suggested we could join their barbecue if we wanted, but our wedding decorations had to go. I watched in horror as she started directing people to move our carefully arranged chairs. Someone was taking down our flower arch. And then I saw it. Karen was replacing our wedding cake with a bunch of chips and dips. That's when I lost it. I shouted at everyone to stop asserting that this was our home, our yard, and our wedding day, and they had no right to be here. Karen brushed off my outburst, claiming a barbecue was much more fun than a boring wedding and that she was improving our event. My fiancé tried to reason with the other neighbors, most of whom looked pretty confused. Turns out Karen had told them we'd agreed to host the barbecue. 
Some started to leave when they realized what was really going on, but Karen wasn't backing down. She threatened to call the police to sort things out if we continued to be difficult. And she did. She actually called the cops, claiming we were trying to crash her event. When they showed up, Karen put on her best victim act, telling the officers that we were trying to ruin the neighborhood barbecue she had organized and accusing us of trespassing and harassing their guests. Luckily, we had proof. We showed the officers our wedding invitations, the rental agreements for the chairs and arch, everything. Our other neighbors backed us up too. The officer then informed Karen that this was clearly a private event on private property and that she needed to leave immediately. Karen protested, again claiming to be the head of the neighborhood association and insisting the yard was practically hers too. The officer explained that's not how property laws work and ordered her to pack up and leave or they'd have to remove her. She sputtered and argued, but eventually she had to leave. The officers even stayed to make sure she didn't come back. We managed to salvage the wedding, though it started a bit late. Our friends and family pitched in to help clean up Karen's mess and get everything back in order. In the end, it was still a beautiful day. The best part? A week later, we found out that Karen had lied about being the head of the neighborhood association. The real association leaders were furious when they heard what happened. Last I heard, she's been banned from all neighborhood events and is thinking of moving. Sometimes I still can't believe it all happened. But hey, at least we've got one hell of a story to tell our kids someday. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time. <laughs>